I'm Nicola Canis, and I'm here with this lovely gentleman from Alberta. Would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, my name is Kyle Cholik. Uh, that's my mundane name. Um, I'll start with uh, uh, greeting uh, Dani Si, Suniao Mahagan, Niti Sikoson, Avakal Uchinia. So I, what I expressed there was hello. Um, uh, Silver Wolf is my name, um, and I'm from Avocal. Uh, my name in the SCA is Edward uh, Vikingson. I'm squire to his royal highness, um, Duke Vic Vikingson. My goodness. Um, and uh, uh, I'm the uh, Silver Wolf, uh, the champion of the sword in the Barony of Borealis. And what does that mean? The the champion of the sword? Yeah. Oh, I'm the I'm the heavy champion of of the barony. Wow, that's yeah. awesome. So, we're here to talk about your kit, which is yeah. awesome. What piece do you want to start with first telling us about this beautiful, absolutely beautiful kit? Um, well, we can we can start with the helmet. All right. Um, I have the most exciting have, part. Yeah, everybody loves the helmet, right? So, um here, I'll grab the helmet right here. So, okay. Um, so I, I fought for a bunch of years with uh, the, the sa that, this same helmet, actually. And uh, it wasn't painted or anything. Um, it just uh, has no chin strap. Right, so it's a chin clasp. It is, yeah. Yeah, so it comes apart here. And then uh, a pin holds the, the, the cheek plates together, and, and which keeps it from coming off my head. And I see you've got a wig over top of it to kind of disguise yeah. it. So traditionally, um, the Nehea people, we didn't, they didn't wear uh, helmets um, or metal or or anything other than leather. Um, so I wanted it to look as much like a traditional warrior as possible. So I, I covered it, the top, I covered the top of the wig um, and uh, I painted I painted the helmet first, um, a darker skin tone, and then uh, I, I put the wig over top and braided the, the wig. It's a 40 inch wig, and then I added all the embellishments and whatnot, like the- You've done um, a lovely job making it look natural. So traditionally the headband isn't isn't a thing. Um, it's more of a, a powwow dancers thing, um, but those embellishments are still traditional. Uh, they just, uh, they were more for dancing and whatnot, but in order to cover like the seam of the hair and, uh, and the, the, the seams of where the, the metal, um, comes together and is welded and stuff, I just added a leather band and then painted it and, and whatnot so that if it gets messed up when fighting, um, it... Quick changeover. Yeah, and it's easy to, it's easy to, to, to replace if, if need be. It's just a piece of, I think, like... I don't even remember how thick, but it's just it's just a piece of leather that I could just cut out and repaint and right. put back on if I need to. But uh, leather is pretty durable on a helmet, so um, that's the yeah. part. And then um, I've decorated it with uh, these are actually uh, my lady's handprints on the side, the the red handprints, mm -hmm. um, which is um, it's for the support of the MMIW, which is. Uh, uh, a movement that brings awareness to um, uh, the missing and murdered Indigenous women, right, uh, of Canada and well, all over North America, um, which uh, well, we thought would bring some controversy, but it actually didn't. It was that's uh, lovely to hear. Yeah, and it's a beautiful piece to bring into the kit to start that conversation. Yeah, well, traditionally, face paint is a is is a thing, um, but you have to even today you have to earn face paint it's not just you can't just wear face paint for no reason you, you have to actually earn it right um, whether it's from dancing or um or, or other uh, um accolades or whatnot um and this is kind of one of the only things that is acceptable um i haven't earned any real life accolades in uh in the indigenous community so 
Uh, that being said, I, I, I don't feel I should be wearing face paint. I mean, maybe later on in, uh, right. maybe later on, if I ever get an elevator or something, I'll wear some face paint or something and I've earned it. Or I feel I've earned it or something. The representation is really beautiful. Yeah. So this also sits on top. Oh my goodness. Perfectly. What's it made out of? So this is a, this is a traditional roach. Um, it's made out of uh, porcupine hair, um, not the quills, but the actual hair, the guard hair. Um, and then there's an outer layer of deer tail hair on the outside. And then there's also on the inside, there's a, an outer layer of, of deer hair. Wow, so it's absolutely the, stunning. The porcupine hair is, is sandwiched in between the two. And then it's attached to one of these. What is So this that? is just like, this is just cotton. Um, it's braided cotton, and then it's wrapped. I'll see if I can zoom in here. So it's like, yeah, you know, it's kind of like wrapped in a in a circular pattern or whatnot, and then lengthwise down. Um, so traditionally, um, uh, not everybody wore them, but this is is a traditional headpiece for the Neha people. Right. Um, uh, it's worn mostly now for with dancing and whatnot, but. Yes. Uh, it, there was, it was common to see back then. Right. So let's talk about that chest piece of yours. You've got beautiful beading and a whole uh, lot of different yeah, so types of leather. <laughs> yeah, so I don't have it with me, but because um, right now it's in it's in a couple pieces. Um, originally, I made a, it's a bone um, uh, tubular beaded breastplate. A traditional breastplate and it has a, a pair of ermine skin hanging from it uh, and I, I originally made it with nylon like really durable nylon uh, thread uh, right which I wasn't too sure how it was gonna hold up I can't I can't break the nylon thread with my bare hands so I wasn't too sure how it was gonna hold up in fighting uh, I had a couple rounds with it and then uh, it, it did break. So the thread broke, the beads didn't break, which is, which is awesome. So That's I have remarkable. to remake it. Yeah. I have to remake it. I'm going to remake it with, um, probably like sinew, um, or artificial sinew anyway, because that is extremely hard to break. Uh, some people mentioned even, um, strands of paracord or, uh, but I, I think the sinew will probably be better. Um, and it's, Right. It is artificial sinew, but it, it, it's still more traditional than a, a nylon thread or whatever. Yeah. We, we uh, strap our, our um, shields over here with that. So I think it's going to be yeah. really hard to break. Yeah, I, I don't think it'll, it'll break. Um, uh, we, me and uh, uh, my good friend uh, Duke Albrecht, he, we spent time smashing the beads to see how much, <laughs> how much force it would take to actually break them. Um, and it does take a relatively large amount of force, uh, but when you have like squishy bits in behind, there's a lot more, there's a lot less. There's less impact force to Yeah, there's less shatter. impact force on them. So they, they won't shatter, but we were putting them on like on a, on a railing and then smashing them with a rattan sword and, and, and they definitely broke. Uh, but when he was hitting me and we were fighting with them, none of the beads broke. It was actually the string that broke or the nylon thread that broke first. So I'll probably just remake it and whatnot. And I, I originally was just going to use it for um, aesthetics. I wasn't actually going to fight in it because uh, I wanted to wear it around after my fight, after right. I was done fighting and, and whatnot, because it was something that you kind of wore all the time. It wasn't necessarily um, only meant for battle or whatnot. So. Uh, and then I wear it over top of a uh, all my all my armor is underneath a uh, an Elkhide shirt. So the shirt's actually a, a half of an elk that I made. Wow! And that must be tough stuff. It's it's pretty tough. Uh, it's heavy and it does not breathe well. <laughs> oh uh, no! But it, has, but it has it has no sleeves and whatnot. And uh, yeah, so it, most of it was just you figure out the where your shirt goes and I, I've sewn it with sinew and whatnot. And then I, I cut the excess into fringe. Um, fringe is a, a little bit of a later period. Um, it was meant to actually like wick away uh, water. So like if it was raining or whatnot, um, it pulls the water off of the material. And, uh, but it wasn't typically worn until 
it, it was definitely more later period like um i couldn't i couldn't actually give you an exact date um because we don't really know but um yeah and uh, so i wear that over top of like uh, just a leather breastplate with a piece of puck board tombstone like gotta gotta love hidden armor all oh, the lighter for me the lighter the better i'm not a, i'm not a huge guy uh, so like if I'm wearing plate or something and weighs me down a lot, I need to, I need to be able to use my, um, my speed as much as possible. So how are you protecting your arms and hands? So my, my arms, I haven't finished my arms yet. <clears throat> I just, uh, I use a shield. So, uh, my left arm, my, my elbow is the only thing that's actually, um, protected. Um, so I do have an, an elbow cop and, uh, I don't I, I don't have the need to wear a bracer or a demi with it because my on the back of the shield my cage covers all of that. Right. Um, on my right arm I do wear a leather bracer which I haven't modified to look traditional. Um, and I wear a leather a hardened leather elbow cop as well that's attached to the bracers. So, uh, but other than that I don't wear armor on my upper arms or anything. And then well, I just have you're braver than I am. <laughs> Uh, and then I, I do have a, a plastic demi right now, but most of that stuff will get covered in most likely either a faux, like a micro suede that's really thin and light or, and, and the same brain tan color of the leather, or it'll get covered in like a faux, uh, brain tan buckskin, um, which is uh, a lot cheaper than buying actual buckskin. So, right. Yeah. One has to remember one's wallet and budget. That's right. <laughs> That's right. This was all pretty expensive, so. Um, I can imagine. Yeah, that's why the roach is. That's why the roach is off of the helmet right now. I'm in the middle of making a new one. Um, this one that I have is real. Like it's 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 a uh, real uh, porcupine hair, which is. That must be hard to find. Uh, it, it's not at certain stores, but it's just really expensive. So it's around seventy dollars an ounce, and you use maybe five six ounces to make a roach. Cool. Um, and then plus the the time it, it takes to make them, you buy them for around can anywhere can be from anywhere between five to a thousand dollars for just the roach itself. So um, I bought uh, synthetic porcupine hair, so it's very similar to the bristles in your toothbrush. Oh. That's what it actually kind of feels like. Um, and then uh, the deer tail is uh, is really cheap as well. So like this in itself is like this so this is the first part of the actual uh porcupine part of the roach so it's actually quite long wow. and then it wraps around that big white piece that i showed you right um and then uh the so the, the synthetic hair is only i think it's only around ten dollars an ounce so it's actually way cheaper and 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 when it comes to fighting if it gets wrecked i'm not worried about it it only took me i think a couple of days to make this uh, it's pretty monotonous but and tedious but it uh it, it was only a couple days and then the deer tails are they actually just come with the whole tail so this this one's dyed red yeah <laughs> but uh you just pull take the hair off and and you shave it off or whatever cut it off and and then uh it gets sewn into a, a line just like that one and then they all get added together and whatnot so right now i'm working on like a, a red deer tail hair and and then i'll wear this probably i'll wear this one when i'm just not when I'm in my normal, when I actually have my, my First Nations garb, like actually done and whatnot, and I can just right. wear it around walking around events and stuff. So, well, that'll be cool. Now I know that the pants that you wear, um, within your kit are traditionally dancing regalia, right? Yeah. So, so normally, um, they would just wear pants. Like the, the Nihil people would just wear leather, uh, buckskin. They're kind of like chaps. Um, and then you'd wear a, uh, a breech cloth. Yeah. Um, uh, you could wear a hide breech cloth, um, over top of that, but there's no room for armor in those pants whatsoever. Right. So I had to modify a lot of different things. Like I wear a, um, like a hockey referee's, uh, pair of shorts underneath, like that's where the padding is or whatnot. Right. Uh, so I don't get butt wrapped. Um, <laughs> I hear that's too, a problem. At least not too bad, anyway. And uh, and then uh, what I made was I actually have it right here. So this is what it is right here. Oh wow! It's, um, it's actually just four plates. 
Oh, I didn't even realize they were big plates. I thought yeah, they were so like a leather. So they're big plates. And then I, um, on the back, instead of sewing them between two pieces of leather, the outside part is, uh, is a brain tan buckskin high, um, leather. And then on the inside, I actually just use like a, a micro suede that's the same color. Right. Micro suede is micro suede is what they traditionally or not what they traditionally is what they wear now for dancing because you can wash it. Um, Modern conveniences. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's lighter. It breathes better than leather, obviously. So dancers use and and they make most of their stuff out of micro suede now. Um, so it's so the the plastic plates are actually just in between these two pieces, um, but it's modeled after. Um, a traditional dancer's skirt. Hmm. So I went with that because it can hide my thigh, like the, it can be my thigh armor and it helps with like the knees and hiding the knees so that they don't look like big giant cops and whatnot. And, and, uh, and then there's no actual armor attached to my thigh. Right. So they, That's I haven't interesting. Been hit, yeah, I haven't been hit in between them yet or anything. So I guess we'll see how that works out when it happens. Yeah. It's interesting to see that you're bringing the traditional way of, of looking and making uh, this kit and the the modern pieces of of First Nations culture in well, with the micro suede. Well, as for as far as dancing goes, um, they there are certain things that 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 dancers, traditional uh, dancers, or even fancy dancers, or any of the dancers really, there are certain things that are still traditional. The looks of things are still traditional as how they would have done during powwows. But um, the materials that they're used now, like there, there wasn't really fancy bright colors. Um, they're very muted tones and, and uh, lots of natural colors. Um, whereas now they use, you know, really bright colors with ribbon and, and, and whatnot. So, there are modifications to dancing currently that um, that make it more modern, but the outfit itself is still typically quite traditional in in style anyway. Right. Um, so I I just I took that part from it instead of wearing you know a pair of pants right over top of my armor or whatnot or having just to a put giant armor. pair. Yeah, I was I was not looking forward to wearing pants. Um, and because most of the time when you see fighters in pants, they're quite big and bulky and uh, traditionally pants were not big and bulky um, uh, in the plains. So uh, yeah, I, I just went this route because it seemed uh, a lot easier is not the word, but um, convenient, yeah. it, you know, yeah. a lot more convenient to, for, for putting armor on and off and whatnot. So yeah. And it's and a then, beautiful blend of, of different parts of the culture as well. Correct. Yeah. Um, and then uh, uh, my knees, the fringe from my from my thigh plates that actually covers a lot of the knee armor. The knees themselves are just I use a uh, uh, goalie knees from from hockey underneath, and uh, uh, they do enough protection. But I did so. Let me see here. I got here's a knee right. Here. So here's so this is just a a, a goalie knee. Right. And it just has like its Velcro pieces that you kind of like wrap around or whatnot. But I did sew like um, another piece of fringe to the bottom part here to hide that part there. Right. Um, just to get you, a little more camouflage there. Yeah, a little more to cover. You can still see, like when I fight, you can still see some of the black, um, some of the black uh, from the armor, from like both my shorts and and the knees themselves. So I'm still working on maybe making a pair of shorts or something that's like a loose pair of shorts or whatnot underneath out of probably just a, a micro suede um, in the same color or whatnot. Right. And then that way you just really won't see them at all. Um, <laughs> They'll just disappear. And then this is my breech cloth. Aha. Uh -huh. Yeah, definitely got my breech cloth. So that, so that goes in the middle. And uh, and then I don't wear anything below up until uh, my boots. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, that's fascinating. I love to hear about other people's kits, and yours is specifically special in such things. Uh, so I love hearing about it. Yeah, I think I think a lot of people have seen that it's 
it, it, it can be special, mostly because it's really uncommon. Um, I, when me and w when I first brought my, uh, my lady to the SCA, she um, she's First Nations, she's Treaty First Nations, and uh, she really wanted to do a First Nations kit. And even myself, I fell into that category of, well, I don't know, you know, like, it's not common. It's not a thing that's really done a whole lot. You know, it's very European-esque. And, and she was like, I don't care. I'm doing it anyway. And I was like, okay, let's then let's go for it. And I love um, that. That is so yeah. good. And then she, she did her garb. Uh, we spent months doing her garb or whatnot and she just had some loaner borrow stuff for the couple events we went to prior to that and then uh and i think it was crown yeah i think it was crown avocado crown in november of last year or no the year prior and uh uh she we she wore her full full kit and it was it's it's gorgeous. So I'm I'm really glad she made big splashes and and she stepped out of the norm. And uh, from there, that's kind of what made me kind of want to do my kit and kind of switch over my personas and, and or my persona and whatnot. Because um, I'm not gonna lie, I was I was pretty afraid to do one, so I didn't know what people would think or anything like that. And well, I'm glad you did it. I hope that it becomes more normal. Yeah, oh yeah, for sure. Why don't we talk about people who want to do this? How, how might you go about such things? Yeah, well, um, there's, since I've posted pictures of, of my kit, there's been 99% positive feedback, and there's definitely been a lot of people who, are, who have uh, been like, yeah, I, I definitely want to do a, you know, a First Nations kit, for sure. Um, and I think that every, it's tricky, because every, tribe is going to be different from depending on where you're from whether it's uh you know the southern united states to northern mexico anywhere in mexico really uh you know anywhere from in northern canada eastern canada um eastern northern eastern united states you know there's there's so many different tribes and they all have so many different little things that are not necessarily unique to the tribe uh because they would have all uh, traded, you know, back and forth, right. um, and and things would have got traded back and forth, and you you'd have some things from some uh, tribal culture move into another tribal culture, which which was common. It was extremely common. Um, so, I would say that like if if any new if anybody wanted to switch their kit and and make a new First Nations kit, um, I would say depending on the tribe, look up the 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 tribal traditional clothing and whatnot, you know, headdresses are different all over, all over the place, um, especially headpieces. Um, even what you wore for clothes would given the abundance of specific animals to what they would normally wear. There's, I know that there's some Southern uh, tribes that, you know, wore grass skirts instead of a lot of hide um, good because of the heat, um, that kind of stuff. So, uh, and then, and then you can take, I would say, don't be afraid to take from, another tribe <clears throat> and and you know just be aware that you know you maybe your persona traded for that piece of of clothing or something or traded for that piece of regalia or whatnot right so that that was common so um yeah i tried to be as 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 authentic as possible but given the restrictions of like our our armor requirements you know um some things have, have to give yeah some things have to give for sure so yeah, I would say go for it um, uh, and just do some of the research for a while. I went directly to, um, I, I'm a tattoo artist by trade. So I went uh, to the, the chief of the Samson Cree Nation, uh, Chief uh, Saddleback. Uh, I tattooed his son a lot. And so we kind of, we kind of hooked up and, and, uh, we hung out a bunch of times and he took me to meet his dad and and from there I met their uh, his ex-wife which is a, a cultural they're one of their cultural uh, leaders and uh, you know some elders and stuff and we went and specifically talked to them about traditional wear 
instead of not every book is going to be completely and utterly accurate no there's a lot of books out there that are good but most of the books are not written by first nations people so it's it, it can be tricky um when you're getting a second hand account of something so i went i would say go to go the directly, source go to the source go straight to the source it's a it's a verbal um like they everything is verbal they don't write like it's not a written history or they they don't write things down you know they pass everything on orally so um if you're gonna you're gonna get the best and most accurate information from those elders uh and uh, i would say take as much as you can from that and pay your protocol and then and then make your stuff so well that's wonderful yeah. Thank you so much for talking with us. No problem. And we're happy to have someone from out of kingdom here and in, in in talking with Eldamir. And Oh, it's my honor. And of course, do you, do you have any other anything else to say or add? Um I'm not too sure. I would say that uh um right now there's a there's a very there's, there's not this isn't this isn't a common thing so i would say that uh you know the more common it becomes the less we we look at it as an uncommon thing so um i would definitely uh, encourage anybody who wants to do a first nations kit to to do it for sure so yeah you heard it here make it yeah. common guys <laughs> all right thank you so much you're welcome thanks <laughs>